social media actually started to bring fans closer to the talent. And lots of uh, comedians have embraced it in a great way and have allowed fans to actually engage in conversations with them, get photos from them, you know, hear their thoughts and over their touring. And it's just really opened up a lot of avenues for people to, to know uh, what their comedians are up to, that they're fans of, and to also learn about ones that they've never even known about or haven't seen. Think of social media outlets, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, whatever it is. Think of it as an extension of the stage that once the lights go out and the microphones shut off, this is just an opportunity to perform more just in front of a different kind of audience and actually a bigger audience than what the stage will allow. You know, hone your jokes and, and write and concentrate on that. But um, the, the important thing is be funny and don't over-promote. If you're just constantly promoting yourself, you're not providing content and giving a special uh, uh, autographed copy of something for free for subscribing to your newsletter. So when you're using Twitter, you're promoting your newsletter because the next thing will come along and, and Twitter's going to find. So you don't have to be on everything, just do, what, do it well. Do, just do what you, uh, just be funny. Work on writing. What does well mean? Work, work honing and writing good jokes and being funny. I like pissing off all the Twitter followers. <laughs> well, that is definitely, being controversial will definitely generate traffic. That is one way to. So I can still do that. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Well, well, Mark, I mean, speaking of that, you ultimately found the success that thought was eluding you by jumping in the contest. <laughs> 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 you know, What's that? What did you say to me? You were, you, when you jumped into podcasting, there were already plenty of comedians doing podcasts. And now there's a flood of them. Yeah. How were you able to find a place for yourself in, in an audience that wasn't even aware of you before? You have a lot of fans who only know you from podcasts. Yeah. Um, How did you do that? I did it. It was really desperation, and uh, and I made the podcast, and we started doing it. And then you know, I even though I resented Twitter and Facebook and, and everything else, I found that that really came from my inability to figure them out. And once I became able to do that, I became addicted to it, like anything else that is rewarding to me. And so. Ultimately, what happened was I became compulsive about those things and, and just kept putting it out there. And people, you know, sort of the, aware, the the truth of the matter is, if you're a performer, you cannot rely on any old style promotional tools. Clubs aren't going to put it in the newspaper, and who the fuck reads newspapers anyways? Clubs, you know, like newspapers are limited. Anything that they will do, it's all on you to do now. And I think I realized that and uh, embraced it, and that's really what made the difference. You have to do all your own publicity for anything. Now, how, how long did it take you to, to find the audience? Was it, was it gradual, or was there a moment where you suddenly saw a surge of interest? Well, I think because I was talking to other people that also had uh, a presence on those things, that, that it made a big difference. And, and certain controversial things made a difference. It, things becoming viral outside of me made a difference. Um, and also the fact that I am you know, relatively needy. And I, I don't <laughs> mind putting that out there. So, you know, the type of relationship I tend to build with people on social networks or on the podcast, it is very personal. It's genuinely personal. And it's uh, quite frankly a bit draining <laughs> in a good way. Thanks, Mark. Michael, you, you also started doing podcasting with uh, Tom Gavin. But you also you blog. Uh, you have all these Twitter followers. You have, you have more Twitter followers than the rest of the state combined. I didn't know that. How, how, how are you able to, to do that? Uh, I wish I could take credit for the number of Twitter followers I have. I wish that were some reflection of my popularity and fame, but it's not. What happened is I got in early on Twitter, and I think I started using it well um, right out of the gate. I started a Twitter feud with, um, uh, what's his name, uh, from Star Trek, uh, <laughs> Jordy. Lamar Burton. Lamar Burton, thank you, Lamar. Burton. Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> no, it was Lamar Burton. <laughs> about, what? Yeah. about the fact that uh, when I started, uh, he had, I don't know, 25 or 30,000 followers, and I had zero. <laughs> and I professed mock outrage at this and started a Twitter feed with him. And then he was a great sport about it and went back and forth for several days. And in the course of that, uh, I gained a lot of followers. And then Twitter uh, contacted me and said, We want to put you on our recommended page. 
And then right after that, Twitter kind of exploded in popularity. So people were kind of getting me automatically. Um, and then, um, so every day, thousands and thousands of people would be subscribing to my feed through notes, through not my doing. And then I think most of them just forgot to take me on. <laughs> How is Lamar doing now? What's that? How is Lamar Burton doing now? Oh, Lamar? Lamar yeah. he's, he's become a good friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to ask you about that audience. Is it, do you find it's passive or if it's active enough that you can leverage that million and a half people to do things to go to Wits Train, which is your current ongoing project? There, uh, I would say there is a, uh, you know, even if it's 10% of, of those people who are actually paying close attention, that's still 160,000 people or so, so it's a lot of people. And I do find that if, if it's the right thing, they can be very uh, engaged. For example, the other day, Bing tweeted this totally gross um, thing that basically said, uh, if you retweet this, for every reach, retweet, we'll get a dollar to uh, victims of the Japan you know, earthquake and tsunami, up to $100,000. And I, I just thought it was disgusting that they did that because they were basically saying, if you, you know, promote us, we'll give a dollar to Japan. So I wrote several sort of offensive tweets to Bing, and that kind of Can you give us an example of one of them? Uh, one of them, well, the first thing, the, the, one of them was uh, not really a joke, but it was just stop using a tragedy as a fucking marketing opportunity, hashtag fuck you Bing. <laughs> <laughs> For every retweet of this, I'll de donate one inch of my dick up to 100,000 inches. <laughs> 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 hashtag fuck you Bing. <laughs> and you know, companies of course are incredibly sensitive to any publicity, and they're getting a lot of it from this. <laughs> Several hours later, I, mean, I, I, I wasn't the only one doing this. I mean, I, I think other people took offense to it too, but, but they, they, they sort of apologized for the, I, I guess, insensitivity or something of, of their tweet, which I thought was kind of the right thing to do. It's wild the power you have with, uh, with the, the, when you have followers. I often wonder about corporations who thought it would be a good PR move to have that. Well, I see that you're constantly angling for upgrades with airlines. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm wondering how effective that is. No, because I, they start doing it. I was generally offended at the service that Delta, Delta <laughs> provided me. <laughs> and you know, to the point where I got on a plane and we couldn't take off because the cleaning crew had not cleaned up barf from the last flight. I'm sorry. And, and, and other problems. So I started compulsively tweeting to the point where my followers were like, you're blowing up my feed. And I was really like, you know, then unfollow me, douchebag, because I had a beef. And they, uh, Delta sent me a gift basket. <laughs> and they, they paid for my hotel. Is there a barfing mover in the gift basket? <laughs> well, it was kind of a barfing gift basket. But, uh, <laughs> but no, but like, it, it just interests me that the, the power that the personality has, if you have enough followers, again, in an actual getting things done way, because I was in this weird position where, you know, Delta was accommodating me, but then a lot of my followers were like, well, what about us? And I'm like, well, that's between you and Delta, and I felt kind of reduced that and had a lot of followers. Well, back to what Michael was saying, though, about being a few uh, uh, publications picked up your tweet in particular, which is how I found out about it, and that's what I was saying to you, uh, Mark, about uh, not avoiding con controversy. Controversy yeah. does create some a momentum and following, not necessarily that you want to always be complaining or getting in the face of somebody and creating trouble, but it definitely can. What <laughs> 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 airline was this? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I fully acknowledge the hypocrisy of using the Bing's response to the tragedy in Japan to simultaneously, although inadvertently, market myself. <laughs> I was doing that as well. It wasn't entirely inadvertent. I mean, I'm aware when I'm doing it that on some level that's happening. I'm sorry. I'm not you don't have to get too meta. You know, go ahead and just be careful. All right, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just be indignant. Take <laughs> that, that, was not my, that was not a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a little embarrassed that I had a real opportunity there to do something, uh, to actually you know, maybe bring real news that didn't have to do with my network. <laughs> um, if you don't know who the sleeping man is, that's Ken Melman, 
uh, who was you know, the, the head of the GOP for Wally Graham Bush's campaign in 2004. I mean, he's like, the, in my mind, an evil fuck. And what, what I had the opportunity was, before he realized what was happening, was to actually have a conversation with him. I mean, he recently come out of the closet, and if I had just asked him the proper question, this might have been averted. I don't know that I you might have gotten as much attention with real news as I did with this, but if, what, what the story behind it is kind of interesting in, in directly what we're talking about. Uh, I was on a plane, he was next to me. I knew who he was. How many people would know who he was? Not many, but I did because I did political talk radio. So I started tweeting on the plane because I had Wi-Fi. And, and there was a moment there where I'm like, I'm sitting next to Ken Melman, this is going to be great, what am I going to ask him? And people were starting to blow up on Twitter. And he's still not online. And then at some point he's, he looks at me and says, are you online? I said, yeah, I am. He goes, well, how is it? I'm like, uh, not that good. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get online. <laughs> and, and then I think, like, the, rock, the proper question to ask him would have been, do you regret anti-gay policy that you supported during your, your time with the Bush administration? But instead, I'm like, well, I'm just going to pull my kid out. <laughs> so, <laughs> because, because he's sleeping. <laughs> and I those pictures. <laughs> Before the plane landed, it broke on Gawker. So I, <laughs> and then he was still not online. And I knew that immediately upon landing, that you know his people would have alerted him to what happened, and that was going to be a long ride to the gate. Uh, and so I actually talked. I, I called a friend. I, I, I emailed a friend on the plane, and I said, "Look, you know, I'm going to get on the phone with you right when we land because shit's going to hit the fan here, and we're going to pretend that a casual conversation." And sure enough, when the plane landed, he turned on his Blackberry, and there was that picture <laughs> <laughs> on his Blackberry. And I'm on the phone with my friend going, so really, you want to eat there tonight? Okay. <laughs> and all my friend is going, is it happening? Is it happening? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. <laughs> he was a professional uh, politico. He did not even look at me or, or mention it at all. So, so what's the takeaway there, knowing that you can go on a kind of Riff or rant on Twitter and get legitimate news or new media gossip. Well, I think there, like, as I said, my regret was I did not ask him that question. I asked him other questions that I was tweeting in real time, uh, paraphrasing him you know, about, about the administration, about Dick Cheney, about you know whether or not you know Carl Rove was indeed you know safe. And I, I, I asked him practical questions, um, and he answered them you know candidly. But the one question that has been Real news that he would not have let out. Um, uh, I think I, I forgot. So I think it's great, you know, when people remember that and every time they get on a plane, they're like, "Who are you going to take your news about to?" <laughs> Which I don't want to be known for that. I'm glad it didn't become that big of me. But uh, I thought it was was good fun and very sobering. And I, I think uh, back to uh, the abject terror of, of corporations and companies uh, to to put themselves out there at the mercy of these guys. It really keeps you on your toes. And I know for the, the comedy store, we were one of the first, uh, we're one of the first comedy clubs on Twitter. And uh, one of the things that I immediately found out was that there were a lot of uh, negative comments out there about our business. But uh, what happened to us because of that, because of guys like these, uh, you become aware of that and you can't ignore it. So what happened to us is because of these assholes, we ended up being uh, a much better club for and, and I think that's really the, the, the takeaway from this, is that, that uh, the power that these guys have, uh, regardless of how it's wielded, is having a positive influence around them. And if they can change what they did, and Delta sent you your party basket, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, good things are coming off of this, and, and it's just raising the awareness of, of I think, uh, the society in general as to uh, where we're lacking uh, with our relationships with each other. Well, and also out working for the comedy store as a business, you also have had to deal with competition from the other clubs in Hollywood, as well as all the other entertainment options. How, how have you? You know, that's interesting. There, there, was, uh, there was a point where uh, the comedy pie was, was pretty big, and, uh, and there were a few people that were having, uh, you know, there was, it was essentially divided into very small slices, uh, into very big slices for very few people. And that sort of uh, went away um, in general. You know, there's less pie out there, and uh, a lot of the, a lot of the businesses out there, uh, not just comedy businesses, but businesses in general, have had to make the decision of do we go hungry or do we all share.